Right. Excited to have everyone here this afternoon. We're just going to wait a minute or so and make sure that we've got all of our attendees here. I know that you're all logging on, making sure that audio is working, but we are so excited to have you here today. See those numbers rolling in. And we're so excited to have alumni and host today, Steve Hertz. I'll be welcoming him in just a minute. I'm excited to have you all here today. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, How to Reach Your Potential, brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Sarah Whitney Anderson, Assistant Director of Alumni and Student Engagement, and I'm so glad you could join us from wherever you are this afternoon. This webinar will last around 45 minutes with time at the end for questions, but if you also have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to use the chat box or the question box. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Hold on one second. There we go. Uh, go back to my script. Uh, and you can also send any questions directly to me um, if you want to keep those private. We will make sure that they are addressed in some way before our time is up. Um, so now over to our wonderful speaker, Steve Hertz, JD91, is president of the Montag Group, a sports and entertainment talent and marketing consultancy. He is also a career advisor to CEOs, lawyers, and entrepreneurs, and young professionals. Prior to joining TMG, Steve was the president and founding partner of IF Management, an industry leader whose broadcast division became one of the largest in space representing over 200 television and radio personalities. The agency represents some of the biggest names in sports and news media, including NBC Sports' Mike Tirico, ESPN's Scott Van Pelt and Dan Schulman, and CNN Chief International Correspondent Clarissa Ward. Now I'm excited to turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody, sort of, parenthetically, um, and, and great to be here. And as, as Sarah said, I, I did graduate from Vanderbilt Law School in 1991. And um, some of you may know me on this, on this Zoom from various parts of life. And um, something happened to me early in life while I was in law school that really influenced the, the kind of the trajectory of my career. And that was uh, in, the, in the summer of 1990, in my second year of law school uh, at Vanderbilt, I worked for a law firm called Curtis Malay Prevo. And I was a summer associate there. And that, for those of you who may or may not be lawyers, the, the second year summer associateship is really a very important uh, time for a, a young law student, future lawyer, because it's where you set yourself up for the rest of your career, or at least your first job. That's kind of the feeding ground to getting that first job. This, the law firm you work for most often hires you out of that program. And that, that summer, there were I think there were 29 summer associates at the firm and they came down to the last day of the summer in the program to tell the kids whether they wouldn't or would get an offer. And I happened to be the 29th person to go in and all 28 before me had gotten offers. And I sat in front of the managing partner for the summer associate program, a guy by the name of Turner Smith. And he looked me in the eye and he said, we know if we don't give someone an offer, it's a very serious decision for us because it, it, it puts a black mark on your record to, to not give someone an offer. So we really have to stress about that if we, if we don't do that. In your case, it's very easy. We're not giving you an offer. And, we, and he said, I, I just don't think you should be a lawyer. I think you're not cut out for this. It's not really where I think your heart is. I don't think you're, you're really that good at it. I don't think that's really where your, your best skill uh, would be applied in the law. And it, it was obviously a very stinging thing to hear at that point, you know, at the age of 25 years old and with your whole career going in this one direction uh, of, of being a lawyer. And then he said something that was also interesting. He said, look, I, I think you actually are a guy who has a lot of talent and ability. You have good skills. I just don't think they're really well suited for this. I think you should do something else with your life. You should go start a business or something and come back here as a client down the road. And I, I thought about what he said. It was obviously a punch to the gut, but when I really processed it and I thought about it, I thought this guy is right. 
and it, 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 that moment stuck with me and has stuck with me for the last 30 years because in that moment, Turner Smith could have done something very easy. He could have just said to me, you know, Steve, you're a great guy. We love you. You'd be a great lawyer. But we only had room for 28 and you just got the short straw or, you know, some version of the George Costanza line from Seinfeld. It, it, it wasn't you. It's me. I'm breaking up with you because of me, not you. And I wrote this book based on somewhat that one interaction in my life and what I think it did for me. And the book is called Don't Take Yes for an Answer. And it's really about this idea, these two ideas about how does one reach their potential, which is what we're here to talk about today. And what I've learned is that even though two people might seem exactly the same in life, they might both go to great schools, same exact school, they might get the identical GPA, they might both work hard, they might both come to the table earnestly and on time. And yet often one person is soaring in their career and the other person is mediocre at best. And the question is why? Why do two seemingly identical people have such really disparate outcomes in their life? Why does that happen? And I, I think the answer, assuming you know, you're doing all the right things, like I said, you, you go to a good school, you study hard, et cetera. Assuming that all is true, I think the, the answer to that question is really about two things. One is about this idea of not taking yes for an answer, really creating what I call in my book, aggressive humility. This idea of not listening to all the good things that people tell about you and really trying hard to always be getting better in your life, in your craft, in whatever it is you're doing. And so the first part of the book, and I think this will help you hopefully in reaching your own potential, is trying to understand that in the last 30 plus years, we've all been kind of unwittingly put into what I call the echo chamber of yes. We really only hear this positive feedback by and large. Now, of course, there are exceptions. It's not a blanket statement, but for the purposes of a thesis, this is the thesis that by and large, we're in the echo chamber of yes. And there are three factors that have caused that echo chamber. One is we've had this massive grade inflation over the last 30 plus years. What, when I graduated from college with a 3-1, that was you know, considered to be an okay, but not great GPA. Today, if you would graduate with a 3-1 from the University of Michigan, that would be considered a lot poorer than it was in 1988. And the reason why is because what used to be a B is now an A, and what used to be a C is now a B. And you really don't see a lot of kids getting C's or certainly D's or F's anymore. And in a lot of schools, you have to get permission to even give someone a C or below. And so there's really this kind of whole curve is, is moved up almost a full standard deviation. So kids are crowded in like a 3-3 three, three to a 3-8 now, most of the kids. So how do you even know if you're really good at something if everybody seems really good? It's kind of a variation of that movie, The Incredibles, which many of you may have seen. And so that's the one factor. The second factor is this idea of this participation trophy. And the participation trophy is fine. It's, it's actually, it, when it started, it had a really good purpose. The problem is, is that the participation trophy has morphed into an MVP trophy. So a lot of us think, and, and myself included, you know, if we got a participation trophy that we were already great at something just for showing up and competing. Um, in my book, I talk about a kid that I know who at that point was five years old and came in, I think, 10th place in a chess tournament and got a trophy that was bigger than him. And so that doesn't really leave you much room for trying to improve something if you're already getting A's and A minuses only and you're getting the participation trophy, which seems like an MVP trophy. And then, you know, the real witch's brew, the third thing that I think is the dangerous part for you who wants to reach his or her potential is this idea that in HR departments in American businesses now, and really worldwide, you, you don't really see people getting fired nearly, if at all, anymore. We have all these euphemisms for downsizing and reorgs and you know all these different things that companies do to get rid of people by doing everything but 
telling people like Turner Smith told me, you know what, you're just not good enough. You're just not doing what we want you to do. And I see it all the time. My main job is as a talent agent. So I represent a lot of broadcast talent. And I can't tell you at all over these last you know, 30 years that somebody actually called up and said, your client is fired. It's always, we're not renewing their contract. We're moving in a different direction. Our needs don't meet. It's, it's, it's almost never been about the actual client, even though it is about the client. Um, so I think it's really dangerous for, for anybody to, to walk through life without ever getting any you know, criticism or, or, or meaningful feedback on how to improve in, in your career if you have these factors creating this echo chamber of yes. And what I'm trying to say to you is to reach your potential is to really become keenly aware of the dangers of that echo chamber. Because what happens is that, it, it, think about it, like if, if you had a cold right now and you started to get a sore throat, let's say you didn't treat that sore throat and you let it go for a few days and then it got worse and worse and worse. And it turned out that you had strep throat and you just left that alone for a few more days and then got worse and worse and worse. And then eventually you'd end up with rheumatic fever and you could end up with damaging your heart and you could end up dying. But of course, none of that would happen because the minute you, most people had a, um, a sore throat, they might do something about it. And certainly when it got worse, they'd go to the doctor and they'd get a, a throat culture and they'd find out they had a strep throat and they'd go on antibiotics and they'd never get rheumatic fever and everything would be okay. And the problem with our business uh, situation here with this echo chamber of yes is you never get to see the symptoms. If no one's telling you you're not good at this or you need to improve this or the reason you're being let go is because of this, you're going to go on to the next job and not really know there's anything you could improve. And then you're going to end up with, you know, just using this metaphorically, career fatality or real career illness uh, because you're not improving anything you're working on. So, as I said, you know, maybe this was in the outline. The thing that will happen to you if you don't become keenly aware of these societal issues is that you'll end up in the vortex of mediocrity because if you're not improving something, even if you're okay at it and you've never been fired, but you're never improving on what you're doing, then you're, you're in that vortex of mediocrity because you're not improving and somebody else is and they're going to go past you. And I think it's important in your career to be striving for improvement and to be better at what you do every day. So that's kind of the, the underpinning of the idea behind the book, but it's not really the main idea. And in terms of reaching your potential, I think it's pretty easy, hopefully, for you to understand these perils, these three factors I talked about, and this echo chamber of yes. And I think it would be hopefully easy for you to be on the lookout for that and, and, and create your own way of determining those symptoms that would otherwise sabotage you. So now we have these two identical people. These, these, they both went to good schools, like I said earlier. They both have done all the right things. And yet one is going like this and one is plateauing. So what's the second factor about why we see this great disparity in outcomes? I think it really comes down to this idea of maybe one person is really well liked by their peers, their colleagues, and people they touch base with in the course of their job. Maybe one person is just more respected by the other person. Maybe those are the factors. Maybe somebody just gives you a good energy and you want to be around that person. And so when you look at the data, you see that when people um, talk about what are the determining both causal and correlative factors in one's success, you find that only 15% of your success is really causally related and correlated to how good you are at the job part of the job, the technical part of the job. So I always say, think of a dentist. You know, if, if you can do a filling and the other person can do a filling, or if you're a lawyer, if you can write a will or draft a contract, the other person can do it equally well. How do you determine who's going to be more successful and how does the person who's looking to buy those services determine whether they're going to hire you or the next guy or the person or, or a third person? And I think that the 85% is largely, you know, comes down to these interpersonal skills that 
determine whether people like you, whether people trust you, whether people want to be around you. And so what I've done is I've tried to just put this in a very simple framework of this idea called AWE, A-W-E. And what I would hope that would, you would get out of today, if you get nothing else out of this, is that you just remember that one word, AWE, A-W-E. That's it. It's an acronym. So nothing else. A-W-E. If you're going to take notes today, right now, write down A-W-E, AWE. And what I'd like you to do is to try to see the world through that prism of awe going forward. And it just really means A, authority, W, warmth, and E, energy. And to unpack that a little bit, think about authority as does someone trust me? Does someone respect me? Are they going to hire me to do the job of fixing the filling in their teeth or drafting their will or drafting a contract, negotiating whatever it is for me, hiring me to do the job? because they trust that I'm good enough to do the job. And again, you may come from a good college, the other person comes from a good college, you both may be perfectly fine at doing the job, but people are gonna get a feel for you, an intuition, if you will, as to whether or not they should trust you to do the job. And that comes down to your authority, the stylistic authority in the manner in which you convey yourself. So if you have a, a weak uh, speaking voice, or if you look away when you talk to people and your eyes dart away from people and you put your hand over your mouth when you talk or you say um and ah all the time, then you have really compromised your authority to convince the person that you can do that job. And you're reinforcing that lack of authority in every aspect of your life all the time. And you're not even aware of the fact that these non seemingly non-performance factors, non-technical factors, of course I can do the job. How would it matter if I cover my hand with my mouth or if I don't make eye contact with you about how good of a filling I can do on your tooth? Well, people are evaluating you that way and you're evaluating other people that way. If, if someone hems and haws and seems very unsure of themselves and they use a lot of filler words, you're going to get the feeling they're just not sure of themselves and they don't have the authority stylistic authority convinced me that I should have them do the job. So that's the A piece in authority and we can get into more detail. And obviously I'm gonna take some time for questions in a couple minutes here. Just wanna get the broad framework out. Then the W piece is warmth. And it's, it, it also is trust. I mean, the, the, the A piece of authority in terms of trust is, do I trust that you're good enough to do the job competency wise? But the W piece in warmth is, it's a different kind of trust do I trust that you have my best interests at heart? Are you looking out for me? So if I do give you the job of filling my tooth, which is killing me because I have a cavity in the back of my tooth here, mouth here, do you care enough about me to take the care and the duty to make sure you fill it right? And it's not gonna fall off in six months or I'm gonna need a root canal down the road or other major problems. And are you connoting that in the way that you speak to me? Or have you asked me questions about me and what my needs are and what potential dental issues I might have? Or when you, you know, whatever job you're being hired for, are you uh, acknowledging the other person? Are you listening to them? Are you really taking in what they have to say? Because at the end of the day, all communication comes down to only one thing, which is how does it affect the other person? And like I'm talking to all of you today, what I say has no value whatsoever only unless it has any value to you who's listening. And if I'm going to do that filling on your mouth and, and help you in your problem, you have to make me feel, or I, excuse me, I have to make you feel like I'm actually going to take that duty of care seriously and communicate that to you, that I'm going to be there for you. And, and so not only do I have the competence to do the job with my A-level authority and communicating that, and I also have that warmth, that trust that you're going to know that I'm going to be there to take care of you and to care about you. And then the last piece of what I think goes into this 85% of the non-technical part of why people are going to hire you or not, or promote you or give you more responsibility in your job is this E energy piece. And it's also very important in that if you think about this, energy is not just my energy coming at you. Now, obviously I'm speaking to all of you today in a vacuum. I can't see anybody. So I'm trying to be very high energy. I don't want anybody to fall asleep. For all I know, maybe you've all fallen asleep already, but my energy is only one part of the dynamic here. Now, if I was screaming like a lunatic the whole time, you might really turn me off and say, God, I can't listen to this guy rant anymore. It's just crazy. 
Um, conversely, if I was just whispering and I was had no energy and I had no enthusiasm for my message, then you might say, oh my God, this guy is so boring. So there's high energy boring and low energy boring. And what we want to do is we want to modulate our energy in a way that energizes you, the listener. I want you to be energized by me. And this idea of energy is also about a dynamic that we're going to create with each other. Because no matter who your audience is, whether it's one or 50, you're in a big room, you're talking to a lot of people, you really want to have that dynamic. You're going to create a dynamic no matter what. So you want to have that dynamic be a positive one. And you want to be the person, and there's many different ways to do this, but you want to be the person in the room that people feel positively when you walk into the room. And you can do that, honestly, if you're a quiet person, maybe you're shy, you could do that by being a great listener. Because when you're listening to someone else and you're attentive to them, you energize the other person with that attentiveness and you're energizing them with your care. Other times you might have to be more high energy and you might have to modulate it because they need to be inspired. But what you wanna do in your relationships obviously is be aware and understanding that these things are playing out in your life. And if you're not aware of this idea that there's an energetic dynamic, then you're potentially one of these people that's not gonna reach their potential and you're gonna end up in a place where you're gonna be plateauing. And so these are the kinds of things that inspire me. They're the kinds of things I like to think about because I think most of us, I think most people on this Zoom today, uh, either you're a Vanderbilt student or a Vanderbilt alum, you're obviously bright, you, you care, you're, you took the time to sign up for this webinar and this must be indicative of other aspects of your personality. So you, you're, you're probably doing a lot of the technical things right question is what are the non-technical things you're doing wrong and how do you identify them and how do you improve them and we can get into more granularity in a minute here but I'm going to stop for a second and um, Sarah I'm going to call on you for a moment um, do we have any questions in the question box or we do people? actually um, okay, there's actually several submitted at the beginning so um, they might not be directly related to what you were just talking about but I do think they're important and if you get to them later you know we can always save them. So some of the questions submitted are, are there certain ways to talk to oneself or mindset that allows you to communicate with more energy? Let's start with that one. How you talk to yourself. Yeah, look, I think you have to just be aware that some of life is a performance. It is. Some of life is a performance. I mean, look, I have a message today to tell all of you, right? I wrote this book. I've got this message. But at the end of the day, the message is separate from me, the messenger, and the manner in which I'm communicating this to you. And, and if I don't communicate it in an energetic way with enthusiasm and, and, and movement and, and, and kind of envelop you in, and, and I don't quote unquote perform for you, then you're not gonna be as interested in the topic as you would be. And I think part of the problem that a lot of people run into is that they look at this word performance in a pejorative way. And I would say, you know, you do that, you do that at your own peril. You, you do that at your own peril. And part of our lives, all of us, uh, salesmen included and lawyers and anybody, there's a certain performance to this. You know, even if you, I, I talk about this in my book, you know, I went through something over the last, you know, 18 months where I needed to have both of my hips replaced for just, I had this arthritic, arthritic condition in my hips and ended up doing a ton of research and meeting with Luckily, I live in New York City, and I have access to some of the best medical care in the world. And I saw three different doctors at the same hospital, believe it or not, the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, which has been voted the number one orthopedic hospital in the world, you know, 10 years running or 20 years running. And even in that hospital, with three of the top doctors, they, they were, they, I got three different opinions and three different uh, personas talking to me. And I ended up going with the doctor that for me at least, perform the best in terms of communicating his authority, his warmth, and his energy. And um, luckily, I've had two great outcomes there. But um, hopefully that answers the question, Sarah. If it didn't, you know, person's more than free to follow up. And I see we have another question in the question box. Uh, I've been trying to find his book. What would the name be? Thank you, Claire. Um, it's called Don't Take Yes for an Answer. Uh, it's by HarperCollins, and you can get that on Amazon or any bookstore. So maybe you can type that in for the people. Um, all right, we have another question here. Um, 
I understand we need to be aggressively humble and have the growth mentality, but how do you not get into the imposter syndrome trap, which is the problem many graduate students, specifically PhD students have, which is that they feel like they're never good enough. Um, that's a really interesting question. And uh, I would just say, I try to stay away from the psychology because I'm not a psychotherapist and I can't say to you why you may or may not have imposter syndrome. I, I can say that there are probably a lot of really good uh, mental health professional professionals that can work with you on that. What I would say to you is, this is just my opinion, apart from the mental health issue uh, of imposter syndrome, is that um, let's focus on the granularity. Let's just focus on the little tiny details of what would connote to you or how you would connote to another person why you might lack authority, warmth, or, or energy. And I think that, you know, for example, if you figure out with the help of my book or you know the resources that are there why you might be hurting yourself because you use too many filler words and how you can stop doing that or why you don't make eye contact when you're speaking or why you're not making eye contact when someone else is speaking or why you might have a bad body language issue and look i actually had a lot of these things and and, and worked them through during the writing of this book some of these issues became known to me so i think if you can do just focus on those little granular issues and not look at it from such a global perspective of, you know, I have imposter syndrome. You know, look, everybody's got something and everyone has some anxiety, some fear, some insecurity, but you really want to talk about the manifestation of it, how the behavior affects you. And I think sometimes it's kind of interesting, this has been my experience, that let's say you have bad body language. Like I had this bad habit of always folding my arms. And that probably was just an indicative of my lack of confidence or my lack of comfort in certain settings. And when I became aware of that and I used these tools in my book on myself and stopped doing that with my body language, the, the, the interesting benefit was in addition to not having that bad body language anymore, I actually changed my own feelings about myself because I wasn't sitting in that closed, almost fetal position. So um, I don't know if you want to, you want to tell me uh, if that answers your question. I would hope so. If not, you know, feel free to follow up. Um, and then uh, Paul asks, you know, who are your typical clients? So, you know, I, I have two different businesses now. One is the, the, the talent agency business, and that's the majority of my life, which is representing local newscasters, local sportscasters, TV weathermen, um, business anchors on places like CNBC, Fox Business Channel, Bloomberg Television, uh, network correspondents, network anchors, international correspondents. So that's, you know, my job is to manage their careers, help them find ancillary opportunities, speaking, marketing, things like that, and also negotiate their contracts, find them jobs, and then help them maximize their value and, 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 and cultivate relationships on an ongoing basis. And then in this new part of my life, since I wrote the book and doing a lot of coaching and speaking, it's been um, uh, banks have hired me, investment companies. Um, I've gotten hired by an anesthesia outsourcing company, uh, several law firms, uh, and then some individuals, you know, and I'm, I'm working with a couple nonprofits right now. I'm working with a humanitarian aid organization right now. Um, so it's just a variety of, of different companies. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, I'm going to keep uh, firing away here. Um, yeah, we have several in the question box too. Um, okay. Can you share more tactics for energy for quiet people? That's one question. Yeah, I like that question because um, I think it's interesting, Alicia, who asked that question, that I'm a pretty you probably noticed, uh, I, I'm a pretty high energy person and I'm, I'm very outgoing. And so I, I, I've really tried to understand and try to communicate that there is no one way to be in this world. And it's just about having an understanding and an awareness of how you're coming across and how the other person is receiving you or how the other people are receiving you in that particular moment. So I, I profile a guy in my book who I think is, 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 is very successful and rather low energy, but very energizing to other people because he does a great job of really 
turning the conversation around to acknowledging other people in almost every situation and really being able to shift the conversation in that in that way. And not only by acknowledging people, by being a great listener and by making the other person feel very attended to. So that creates its own really great energy. Um, so that's one thing that I think that quiet people can naturally use to their advantage and, and, and be very successful as that trusted person in the room, that person who's a good listener. Because there's really, there's really a great shortage, frankly, of great listeners in this world. And if you can really kind of assume that lane in your life uh, and in your world, you'll be very successful. And um, ultimately, what, what life comes down to, in my opinion, and what success comes down to is we are all here to solve someone else's problem. And, and, and if the, the most successful people, I think, are able to, A, figure out what that other person's problem is by asking questions and listening attentively and then following up. And when that person is talking about their problem and, and really able to verbalize it in a way maybe they haven't done so before um, because the person is so inquisitive and attentive and so great at listening, they will speak more about the problem in a different way that maybe someone else would never even find out. So now you have a chance to solve that problem that has never really been properly enunciated before. And you're gonna get the business over everybody else or the trust of the person um, by, by doing that. And, 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 and again, by getting that person to be able to speak about their problem in a different way and really get it out and then know there is a solution for it, that's gonna make that person very energized. So uh, Alicia, hopefully that, uh, answers your question. If not, I would be happy to um, to, to answer more. Um, so should I just keep going going here, uh, Sarah? You want to fire them up? You, whatever you yeah, better. I can. Okay. So the next question is, what do you think makes one employee stand out over another? I think a person's attitude is so important. Can you share some tips like this? Yeah, I, I think, again, um, you know, what, what makes a person stand out? Now, obviously, look, one thing I just want to say is that this book that I've written, it's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not a cure-all, and, it, and it's not the only tool in the toolbox. I mean, if you buy the book, hopefully you read it and like it, and you say, oh, wow, like I didn't realize that was something I should be focused on, but, it, but it's not to the exclusion of all the other things you should be doing as well to make yourself successful and valued in your company or in your life. And I think that what makes someone stand out is, you know, again, just trying to come at a situation with a viewpoint of what does the other person want in this relationship, in this situation? How can I solve someone else's problem? And there's, there's a lot of books been written on this. It's this idea of servant leadership. And if, if you're serving someone else in your own leadership style or in your own performance, then you're going to get everything that you want out of life. And because you know, you're not selling anyone anything, you're really solving someone else's problem. And if you can be that person that is solving someone else's problem, you're gonna have immense value. And I find that in my own company, the people that are uh, doing their jobs, doing them, you know, relatively quietly and don't need uh, a lot of uh, hand holding. I mean, when appropriate, you wanna hold someone's hand, but don't need too much of it. Those are the people that you're, and, and once they show their confidence and you trust them, uh, those are the people you're going to want to assign more and more things to, and they're going to get more and more value that way. So a lot, a lot goes into this, but again, you know, I, I think you should sort of see things in your own career, how you're doing through this awe prism. And maybe there's like a few blind spots that you have that, um, you know, like I said, you might just really have this bad body language or voice that's turning people off, or um, you might, have this bad habit of darting your eyes when you're speaking to people or, or, or you, you may have developed a bad reputation as a bad listener or what have you. And so these are the kinds of things I think that can be easily remedied with, with the granularity that we can teach here and, and can make a huge impact in your life. That is so, I cannot recommend that enough. Um, okay, so I actually think this next question is really helpful. So obviously, interviewing, job search, everything has pivoted now that we've moved virtual for so many things. So do you have any recommendations or to this question, do you find the performance of communicating has been adjusted when talking to people over Zoom or any other platforms? Um, do you have any recommendations for that? I do. I do. 
I feel like I haven't answered everything here today. It's like perfect uh, situation. It doesn't always work that way. But yeah, I wrote an article about this and then ended up getting hired by a few companies for this of how to communicate on Zoom. And I, it, this is very difficult today because I don't see anybody. But when you have a Zoom situation, when you get to see the audience, a, a couple tips that I have is, you know, stop and, and, and try to make um, contact with, with someone. So, for example, the only person I could see here today is Sarah, and um, she's now gone silent. Okay, now I see Sarah. So what I might do is say, you know, I see, I see Sarah out there. You, you seem to be, um, you seem to be understanding this message. She seems to be resonating with you. Sarah, uh, do I have you here? Am I, am I, am I right? Can I, can I get a thumbs up? And now Sarah's giving me the thumbs up and she's nodding, right? But let's say there are 20, 30, 40 people on the screen. I can pick out a variety of different people. I see Bill up here. Bill, you're up there. You're kind of smiling. Um, I feel like you, you got this one. Uh, and then I'll say, Joe, I, I, you, you might be a little lost. Joe, do, you, do I, should I repeat that for you? And Joe says, no, that's okay. I got it. Or maybe he'll say yes. But if I can do that in the, in, the, in the context of this conversation, now Joe's on his toes, Sarah's on her toes, Bill's on his toes, everybody's paying attention because you know you might get called on next. And this is like the beauty of Zoom that it, it really is like having everybody in front of you at the same time. You don't really actually get that if you're in a lecture hall where you'd have everybody in the exact same point. And everybody wears a name tag now, like I see Sarah right there, you know, I, even though I, I obviously have met you, Sarah, before, but even if I hadn't, um, now I could, we have a much more familiarity with each other because I've said, Sarah, Joe, Bill, Bob, Tom, how you guys all doing there? You know, so that's one thing I think you can do is, is really to kind of engage the audience, bring them in. And, and, and this is really important, uh, that a point I'd like to make, because this is really the essence, I think, of the difference between really good communication and not good communication, and also touches on the idea of energy, which I think it was Alicia who asked that earlier, which is to, to, to have a good conversation and to have good communication and to have this idea of warmth and trust and also good energy is to have a dialogue with a person. What, what you don't want to have happen, and unfortunately we are kind of having this today because I, I have no other choice. We don't want to have a monologue with people Nobody wants to be in a monologue with another person. And um, you've all been there at the cocktail party or wherever in a bar uh, in your life where you met that person or you know the person and you cannot wait to get away from that person because they just don't stop talking. They're not acknowledging you. They're not reading the body language. And so what I like to try to do, and this you can do over Zoom also, is when you just give that pause and you say, are you following me? Okay, so now Sarah is great, by the way. She's the perfect audience today because she's been nodding her head periodically as I've been talking about this monologue versus dialogue thing. And even though she hasn't said anything, just those little nods and those little smiles and the little head, the eye you know, acknowledgement that she's given me has turned this little monologue that I've given you for the last minute here into a dialogue with Sarah because she's being so interactive. And so that's what you have to look for in a conversation is try to get that other person to respond. And what I would say to you to conclude is if they're not responding, you're in a monologue and get the hell out as fast as possible. And the way to get out is to shut up and stop talking, which I'm going to do right now. So Sarah, you, you can Keep I'll keep going if you like. But I cannot, I love keeping my students on their toes whenever we have programs. And I do kind of say, hey, Joey, what do you got for us? <laughs> Let's make sure you're uh, engaging with us. Um, so I like this next question. And it comes back to put the light on you. And what did you do after you got the feedback from the law firm? And how did you figure out the next path? What was that transition like? It was a difficult one. It, it was. And, you know, you, you're talking to a guy today who really struggled through most of his 20s, actually, professionally, went through, I don't know, three, four, five different jobs um, over that period of time. I, I really, you know, my identity was kind of really geared towards just this one thing in life. I, I, um, I have a father who's an 81-year-old retired successful attorney. 
I have two older brothers who are both successful attorneys, worked at big firms in New York City before going out on their own. And uh, a younger sister who's a graduate of NYU Law School, also attorney. And um, so this is kind of the family business, cousins, et cetera. And this is my whole life was geared this way. And, and then in that one moment, my identity was really just stripped away. But I, I was on a process of searching what else did I want to do? And eventually, I really loved media. Media was something I really loved. I had gone to the University of Michigan and was a, a, a student newspaper reporter. That's what I thought I would do with my life when I got out of high school because I was an editor of my school newspaper and yearbook uh, sports actually. And, um, you know, that, that was my life. And then later on in college, I, I ran for student government. I was on the student government. So then obviously going to law school, I loved politics and media and um, sports and, and eventually was lucky enough to get a job at a, at a sports agency that represented media personalities. And, you know, this is going back to like 1992. I didn't know in 1992 at the age of 26, when I first got this job that media personalities had agents. I didn't know that was a thing that even existed in the world and feel very fortunate to have found that that was a career one could have is representing media and sports personalities as, as an agent. And, um, and, and that, that's what I eventually did. And, and, and you know, did, did different things in that field. First, I was in the marketing side of it, just doing speaking and, and, and commercials. And that turned out not to be the best thing for me. And then eventually, you know, kind of landed on this contract negotiation, really, really heavy into relationship management, career management. And, and, and I started my own business literally on my 30th birthday, that was when I started my company and then had that company on my own for 20 years until folded it into this bigger business. And now I'm a partner there. So I've done this for 25 years. I've, I felt lucky to have landed on something that I think is, is well suited to my skills. Great. I think that definitely is helpful to see that you had to go through the same battle that many of our alumni or students might be going through right now. Uh, okay, so now we're getting several questions again, going back to those strategies and what is some ways that you can talk to your supervisor or management in order to make sure that you're assessing your awe performance, if you will. Um, so that's kind of one tip, uh, but also I just want to go ahead and let you know that we're getting lots of gratitude and thank you for coming on today. So I definitely want to go ahead and share that with you. Um, so yeah, why don't we start with that question of just, do you have any advice of how to start that conversation with supervision management on how can you work on those tactics? It's a great question. Um, I, I, I think everybody, you know, people want to hear, that pe people want to help you. I, 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 this is a very broad statement, right? But I think people do want to help you. And I think if you, you approach somebody and, and say, look, I, I, I want you to evaluate me. And, and, and a lot of times people will say, you know what, you're great, you're great. And, and I'll just share a quick story with you if I could, because it's from the book and I think it's, it's instructive, is that um, when I started writing the book, I don't know, maybe, maybe I was in the middle of it, three or four, about four years ago, we had just hired this young, young guy to work for us. His name is Reed Bakula. And he, he, he started as, a, as an intern, a paid intern. And the idea was that he would do that for anywhere from three to six months. And then he would be promoted to junior agent train, you know, basically like a trainee position. And then he would hopefully move on to an agent role. And he was with the company for maybe two months. And he came to me and he said, how am I doing? You know, I want to, I want you to know, I, I know it's like three to six month evaluation. How am I doing? And I said, Reed, you're doing great. You're really great. You, you're, you, you've really, um, you have a great attitude. Everyone likes you. You're, you're willing to do anything. You, you pitch in. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. And, and he was 22 years old at the time. And what he said next really stunned me. He said, I, I really don't want to hear that from you. I, I just don't want to hear that. And I said, what are you talking about? I just told you you're doing great. He said, Steve, you know, I've been here long enough to know the book you're writing. I know your whole mindset. Don't take yes for an answer. I don't want to take yes for an answer from you. I don't want to hear that I'm great. I'm 22 years old. Uh, what, what can I do better? What's one thing you would change about me if you could, or you know, that you would g give me advice on? And I, I was, it's, it's one of the most stunning conversations I've had professionally in my whole life. And 
I said, wow, this, this kid's got something. He, he's got something going for him to say that to me. And I, and I said, all right, Reed, you asked, I'm going to tell you, you, uh, you lack authority in your demeanor. You do. And the reason why you do is because you say the word like almost every other sentence. It's, it's just a really bad habit that you probably don't even know you have, but you say like all, all the time. And he said, okay, okay, thank you. That's good. That's good. Just like that. I remember it like it was yesterday. Okay, I can work with that. So, all right, give me some time. I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll be back in touch with you. So two or three weeks later, he comes back into my office and he said, all right, how am I doing? And I said, you're doing terribly. You have not improved at all. And so the point of all this is think about what set the stage for this. He came to me first for the feedback. I gave him positive feedback. He said, no, I'm not taking that, which I think all of you should take in your life. Even if you get positive feedback, even if you are great at your job, what's the one thing you could do better? You know, that you could ask a colleague, a boss, a friend, what's one, you know, maybe I have like a personality tick that you don't like. I'm asking, I want to improve. You know, this is not a time to worry about offending me because I'm begging for it, right? You're setting the stage for this open dialogue you can have with someone because they're not going to worry about offending you because you're asking for it. Right. So anyway, after I told him he was terrible, he said, all right, well, you know, I'm trying. And I said, Reed, don't worry. You're going to, you're going to solve this problem. And I said, here, here's your homework assignment. And this is an important tip for all of you, I think to take away from today, which is you um, can't solve a problem by being told you do something wrong, right? That's not enough. It's, it's a great first step, but like Reed found out, he said the word like too much, it didn't help him solve the problem. And what is, what's important is to be able to solve the problem in the moment and to have that level of self-awareness in the moment, which is very hard for people to do, you know, almost impossible. So the tip that I gave him is, I said, go home for the weekend. It was a long weekend. It was Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. Uh, and I said, go home for the long weekend and, and, and just enjoy your time with your parents who's still living at home at the time and your friends. And, and it's, it's going to be great. Don't worry. Say the word like to your heart's content. But your homework assignment is I want you to be hyper aware of anybody in your life who says the word like. Just take a really strong mental note of it. So exactly what I had hoped would happen happened. He comes back the following Tuesday and he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is. I promise you, I'm never going to say the word like ever again. And the bad news is I can't stand any of my friends. I can't be around them. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this going forward. Hearing the word like, it's like chalk, you know, nails on a chalkboard for me now. And to, to, to that end, he, he never did it again. And he, and he still has not And he'll actually point out to me when I say the word like, which is kind of funny. But I have found in my own life, in researching this book, my wife told me, that I had this bad body language where I would cross my arms all the time. And now when I, before COVID, if I would go to a, an event or a wedding or whatever, I would, I become very aware of other people who are crossing their arms. And that alone would stop me from crossing my arms if I was doing it. And now if I'm standing in front of someone like this, I'll always unfold them. And it's become kind of a running joke with my wife. Even if I'm cold and I do this for a second, she'll, make note of it. And um, so it's very, it's that, that I think is a very easy way to change, to change behaviors. And, um, and then again, you know, sorry, Sarah, this was probably too long of an answer, but to, to answer the question, what, one thing I've said is that my book is called don't take yes for an answer. The most important word there is take you. It's your job. If you want to get better, this entire lecture today, this entire point of, of today's talk is for you to make the changes in your life it's not going to change my life whether you get better or not and it's not going to change the person who if you ask let's just say sarah for feedback and sarah gives you great feedback if you go on to to be great or not great it doesn't change her life it's only going to change your life and so it's not about don't give yes for an answer it's about don't take yes so it's incumbent upon you to change that dynamic and i think it's very easy to do so and hopefully you get that now so you already started, I think, on this last question that I was going to ask, but uh, just to see if you have any other things to add to it. So on the reverse, we've had some people say that they want to help those that they are managing, that they are working with. 
how do they give feedback without burning a bridge and making sure that it does come across as I want to help you grow. I want to help you in your career. Wait, can you just repeat that? Because I was unfortunately looking at someone else's question. Yeah, of course. So on the flip side of asking for feedback, how does a manager or supervisor wanting to help their, their team work, grow and develop, how can they make sure that they are coming across from, I want to help you and not burning any bridges, um, but wanting to help those within their team grow and develop these important skills? It's a great question. I think there are two elements to doing that. What, what is Check, check your ego at the door, right? I mean, you're a manager. That comes with a lot of power and a lot of responsibility. And, and, and really, I think to be a great manager, you have to come from a place of wanting to serve someone else. Again, that idea of servant leadership. And you want to help solve someone else's problem. And understanding that you got to find people where they are. You know, like I might be able to tell you, Sarah, you, you got this bad habit with the word like, because I, you know, like I said with Reed, um, I could just come right at him. But maybe there's another person that I can't say it to in those in those ways. And I have to be a little gentler about it. I have to come a little bit around around the corner with it a little bit, even though they're welcoming the conversation. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is can you effectuate some kind of improvement in the person that you're coaching? Because that's your job. And, and you should judge yourself by the results you get. And the outcomes that change. And if the out, if if I tell you, Sarah, you stink, and I'm, you know, you say the word like too much, you do this, this, and this wrong, and you know, if you only did this, this, and this better, you'd be so much more valuable to me. Okay, all I've done is denigrate you. I haven't been any constructive, and you know, the net net is that six months later, a year later, you haven't gotten better at all. All I did is make you feel bad about yourself, and and there was no improvement. So I think as a leader and as a boss. But if I actually understand that Sarah needs to be talked to in a certain way and I've got to you know, nurture her and get her to open up and to be more trusting of me to say what I'm going to say because she knows that I've got her best interest at heart, then we can make some progress. So I also think you can model that behavior with your team as I try to in my life by saying, I need to improve too. Just because I happen to be 20 years older than these other people that work for me by dint of luck or whatever, you know, birth order and or I have more experience. It doesn't mean I'm better than you. And, and it doesn't mean that I don't have room for improvement also. And we should all, in my opinion, be on a path to constant, you know, self-improvement in our lives and not to come from a place of condescension. And I think if you open the door to your staff to say, look, I want feedback as well on what I could be doing better and, um, and, and get that feedback and, and they know they can give it. Then it really, it truly does become, I think a rarity in that it does become this, I know we talk about this, HR people talk about this a lot, this idea of 360 degree feedback. As you know, Sarah, it's, it, it doesn't happen that often. It's, it's pretty rare. Um, but if you can create that 360 degree culture, then it, then it becomes a really, I think, a continuous self-enforcing virtuous cycle with you and, and your staff. And, and, the, and the last piece of it is this, is that um, I would say this kind of goes both ways to your last question is for, for those of you looking for feedback, and, and I think Reed knew that I embodied this with him, and, and both of you looking to give feedback, I, I like this term tough love. You, you know, people talk about it a lot, tough love. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's probably in the reverse order. I, I think about it as love tough, right? In the sense that the love has to come before the tough comes. If, if you don't show a person that you're really vested in their outcome, in their long-term interest, in, in, their, um, in their career, then, then all the toughness in the world is going to be worth nothing because um, they're not going to really have the trust that you care about them and are vested in them. And I, but I think conversely, if you do create that foundational love, and you can use a different word if you want, but trust, if you will, and, and you really have that basis of, of that relationship, and they know you care about them, then there's a lot you can say um, to them that, that, that gives you a lot of latitude to do that, you know? You know? And um, it, it's, just, it's a fascinating thing that it, it's, it's, it's very binary with tough love. Either it's there or it's not. 
And um, I think a lot of people miss that. They really miss that. And, you know, again, I said earlier, if you're going to take notes on this seminar, you know, write down the word awe. And if you, so I said, as the only thing you had to write down. And if you're going to write one more thing down to take away from today, write down tough love, because I think it's really the foundational basis for any good relationship. And it's really uh, not just your professional life, but your personal life, too. And, and as a leader, I think it's our job as leaders to really lay that foundation in our organizations of tough love. And, um, and, and, I, and I, it's just it's, it's so important. So maybe, you know, that's something I really want to emphasize, as I already have. I've definitely been writing down lots of notes personally. So I'm excited to take this to my supervisor and team. Hey, hey, Sarah, uh, just yes. one last thing before, before we yeah. end. Um, I, I, I did, um, I, I, I did want to answer this one last question if, if this guy Everett is still here, because he asked a really interesting question that maybe other people are asking. Is there truly such a thing as being overqualified for a job? If so, in the current pandemic environment, for someone who's looking to pivot careers since starting at the bottom is back to being the norm, how does one overcome the overqualified distinction? I think it's the way to do that is by showing um, this curiosity, you know, about the position. So like, for example, if I was applying to be uh, in a job that I was overqualified for, I would try to emphasize to the person just my abiding interest in the subject matter. So let's say I wanna be a kindergarten teacher and I'm, I'm not overqualified to be a kindergarten teacher. I'm just using it metaphorically. Um, if I was, let's say I was a law professor and that was considered overqualified. I would say that I, I am just absolutely fascinated and interested in, uh, in, in five-year-olds. That is where my life has been. I've been reading books about five-year-olds. I, I, I once had two five-year-olds. I, I, that's where my heart is. So if, if, let's say even if you're, take an extreme example, you, you've been a, a doctor and you want to now be a, a work at McDonald's, right? You want to be the guy who actually you know, works at McDonald's as a short order cook. You could say, look, I've had my success in, in this other field. I, I want to be a short order cook. It's where my heart is. I watch the Food Network. I watch Great American Bake Off. I, I love the idea. I'm such a competitive person. The idea of being able to fry 100 burgers in an hour is, is just where my heart and soul lies. And I think if you can show the other person your interest in their field, um, then they want to hire you. It's the W and R at work. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I went ahead and just submitted the survey so that we, I know that people are, might be on their lunch hour. So I want to make sure that y'all could fill that out so that we can continue to make our webinars and career programs a wonderful. Steve, I can't thank you enough for sharing this wonderful information, for sharing about your book, your advice, answering the million questions. We still have questions coming in. Um, Sarah, if anybody has follow-up questions, they're, they're more than welcome to email me. My personal email is steve at ifmanagement.com, steve at ifmanagement.com, uh, um, or send me a note on LinkedIn or what have you. I, I'm more than happy to answer anybody, anybody's questions. It's a topic that I love talking about, as you can tell. And if there's any help I can provide, happy to do it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and actually, I will be sending out an email, um, if not tomorrow, later, um, early next week with follow-up information. So I can include his email in that. We will also, several questions did ask if this webinar would be recorded. It is being recorded. So I will include that archive link in that follow-up email. Um, so definitely make sure to check out all of that. We also have several career opportunities coming up in the next month. Um, we have a job search boot camp with career coach Hallie Crawford. And we also have a new career program different than a webinar with one of our professors Corbett Doyle talking about inclusive culture in the workplace you can sign up for any and all of those opportunities on the connect um, so again I just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon thanks thank you Steve for joining us sharing us this advice sharing about this information I am truly grateful like I said I took lots of notes so I'm excited to put this into practice um, and continue to add this. Um, also, several of you asked if students were welcome. They were, we shared this with the Career Center, so we definitely have students on there. We will make sure that the Career Center can also use this archive link. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Stay happy, stay good, use this awe um, anagram so that you can go on to your lives. And thank you, Steve, 
Um, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye everyone.